Good morning and welcome to the Methodist Church. We are glad that you chose to worship with us and join us in our missions, growing disciples, loving our community for Christ. We recognize that you had a choice as to where you would worship this morning, and we are appreciative that you choose us. Help us know that you are here. If you are watching online, just type a little comment, say hello or hi, I'm here. If you are with us in person, we ask that you would text the word here to area code 559-657-6848. That's 559-657-6848. I really appreciate those who participate in our Text in Church program. It helps me keep accurate accounts and the, for the reports that I'm responsible for. So thank you for texting the word here. If you would like to support our ministries and plan on giving today, we have three convenient options for you. If you are watching us online, you can go to our website, visaliamethodist.org, and click the Giving tab. For those who are here, you can drop your checks in the plate that's out in the lobby, or the iPads for electronic giving are available for those who prefer electronic giving. We also have new drop boxes on either side of the doors. We thank you in advance for your generosity. Our upper room daily devotions are available for those who are interested. You may call the church office or see me after services to get more information on how to get your hands on one of those. And our grief share program will begin a new cycle this fall. Starting September 10th, they will be meeting on Thursday afternoons in a hybrid situation. So if you have lost the love of uh, a loved one, um, someone close to you, uh, we are here for you. We will take that grief journey with you. Give me a call or email me or go to griefshare.org and look up our particular offering. Again, that's going to be a hybrid model. Um, so if you are grieving the loss of a loved one, please reach out to us. Don't go it alone. Divorce care will also start in a hybrid model uh, come September. We are debating between September 14th and 21st for our start date. If you will just give me a call or check the website, we will nail that down this week. Again, this time of pandemic isolation and quarantine has just ravaged families. And for those going through divorce, we are here for you. We will help you find healing through the love of Christ. Today, Pastor Steve continues his sermon series on evangelism, sharing Jesus with others. The recordings will be posted on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. Don't forget to give us a like and follow us on our Facebook page. And now, wherever you are, if you will prepare your hearts to receive God's word and stand as I read from Psalm 29, 10 through 11. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. And now, if you will bow your heads and join me in prayer. Loving, creating God, you have pledged to be our God and ask us to be your people, trusting in you always. Yet we find many excuses to prevent us from really trusting in you. We build barriers before our faith journey even begins. Our time, obligations, energy, all become part of the walls between us. We talk about the journey. We daydream about what it would be, what it would be like to truly place our hands in yours and follow you. Yet when it comes to actually making the journey, our time constraints, weak commitments, and fears 
stand between us. Help us to tear down this barrier. Make us ready for the journey by replacing the fear in our hearts with a sense of joy and challenge of self-discovery and discipleship. Make us bold enough to accept your call and give us strength to follow through. We pray for our pastors, Steve, Corazon, and Dawn, that your anointing will be upon them as they share your message and shepherd your people. Make us ready to receive your good news and then to be witnesses to your love to all your people. As we pray for our own needs, we pray for the teachers and students as they climb the mountain of distance learning. We pray for our families and friends, and we pray for the strangers in our community. Cover them with the protection of your grace, mercy, and love. We pray these things just as D Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, we will worship together with pre-recorded music. We thank Alejandra and the band for taking the time to bless us with music in song.
Son of God, you are the one. You are the one we're living for. And we will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you.
in there somewhere okay good morning the Lord be with you so a great deal uh, I, I, I sound a little bit like I'm in a tunnel again and I am sometimes but I'd rather do we know how to it, can you hear me okay okay is it all right okay so uh, uh, I know it's not okay with me though it's reverberating back and forth can we fix that can you hear that it sounds like a tunnel? Kelly sounded all sweet and lovely. Let's go to, <laughs> let's go to that mix. <laughs> it might be that she is sweet and lovely. I, I think that sounds better. Yeah, let, let's just leave it there. Great. All, all right. So much of the satisfaction in life has to do with the internal mindset. It has to do with what you think you are doing and how well you think you are doing it. For people who live their life believing that the whole object of life is to outgain everyone else, to have more, to be more important, to be uh, the greatest amongst all of their peers, life is a succeeding journey of uh, mountaintop highs when they win their next victory, followed by desperation and loneliness and isolation as they see someone else still ahead of them. In the coronavirus uh, and the shutdown that we have been enduring now for a very long time, my observation is this. People who were intent on being winners and, and separating themselves from the pack or whatever kind of language you want to put on it, they have had the roughest time of all because the brakes were put on the game, so to speak, and there was no way to continue to satisfy the need to feel better than other people. If, on the other hand, internally, you have begun to be transformed by the Spirit of God so that what you think you're doing with this life is more relational, caring for and about the people around you, and trying to find a way to be of service to your peers instead of separating yourselves from them, then the coronavirus has the potential and has for some people to be a, a time in life when though it is scary for everyone, it is also a time of deep satisfaction as the core values that are carried in that mindset and that heart set bloom in a time when everyone needs more companionship, more company, more assurances, and, and more care. So today, as we talk ab about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, I want to start off with that kind of uh, uh, dichotomy, the, the, the black and white uh, idea that a, a lot of how our life goes, at least how we feel it goes on the inside, has to do with what we think we are doing with it. If you think that you are trying to serve God and to follow the instructions and the example of Jesus, even times that are worse than the coronavirus can be times of deep satisfaction, even sometimes when that satisfaction has to be mixed with loss. It really is dependent on who or what you have decided to give your life over to. I'm going to begin uh, this morning by reading out of Luke, the 15th chapter, uh, it is a story that everyone, even non-Christians, are aware of this. It's such a true story that Jesus told in parable form that it has transcended uh, churched and unchurched. Uh, everybody has heard some snippet of it. Jesus said, there was a man, and he had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so the father divided his property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent 
everything. A severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, Now how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, and here I am dying of hunger? I'm going to get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And they began to celebrate. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture. The prodigal son is a story in which Jesus illustrates how God sees the situation of Israel at the time that he sent Christ to redeem Israel. Israel looks worn out from her sins, from being a nation that pursued the wrong things or the things that weren't of God, and she has paid a horrible price as she has been subjugated for several hundred years by the time Jesus comes into her. So, Jesus, when he tells this parable, is is saying, look, the the nation, the people of God, the chosen ones are are worn out in a pig pen eating filth, and they need only the humility to come back to the ways of God, and they will be restored. This nation that is now dead can live again. We see the story, of course, on a more personal level. We see it as being an illustration of the human journey into salvation, into a heart set and a mindset that says, with my life, I am going to choose to follow the leading of of God. I'm going to try to be the things that Jesus wants me to be. The common language that we use that we're all familiar with, and we're familiar with it because it tells the whole of the tale. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. That is the witness of everyone who finds saving grace in Jesus. The specifics change a great deal, but the transformation inside about what we are doing with our lives never changes. I followed my own way. I was interested in my own things. I was trying to find glory for myself, and that hurt me. And when I was hurt so badly I thought I would die, I turned to Christ and I gave to Him all of my effort and energy and the rest of my life, and I discovered that I was made new again. When the situation of a person's life breaks them down, and fairly or unfairly they pay that heavy price, the truth is they stand at the best moment of their existence because they are oh so close to being acceptable and accepted by God at transitioning so that no matter the circumstance of their life, they will never be isolated, alone, and afraid again. One of the ways that I remind myself of this, I keep in my pictures in my iPhone, that's the equivalent of keeping it in your wallet a long time ago, a saying, and here is the saying, for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks and its insides come out and everything about it changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. That is the tale of our faith. It's a a beautiful tale because it doesn't matter how far bad you have gone, how lost you might be, but it is a horrible tale because the price that has to be paid is, is to give up on yourself and to turn your life over to the direction of a higher power. 
the young man in the story, drunk, debased, stupid, and suffering from all of those things, sits in filth, thinking about eating pig food. And in that moment, Jesus says, he came to himself. He finally squared it up. He, he did uh, an appropriate uh, listing of how his life got to where it was, and he made the decision that he needed to change and to go back and to be a servant, not looking for the world to serve him. The calling of Christians is to become people who recognize such situations in their lives and in other people's lives and see in them not something to gleefully humiliate other people with, not something to taunt or uh, to put down other people with, not something that makes us feel better and more self-righteous about ourselves, But when we see other people's shell cracking and their insides coming out, Christians are called to understand that is the time for us to give our witness. That is the time to talk to someone earnestly about another choice in life. That choice being stop serving yourself all the time. Stop following the stupid ways of the world and begin to give your life over to the ways of Jesus Christ, which prosper you whether you're rich or poor, hungry or fed. When we see someone paying the price of sin in their life and the price of sin in the world, since all bad things are not always our fault, the astute Christian who has indeed been lost and found understands that they are seeing an opportunity to share the good news at a deep and profound level at a time when someone can actually say yes. The calling then of Christians, all of us, is to become people who are smart enough in the pursuit of our faith and courageous enough in the face of humiliation to see those times in another's life and learn how best to pronounce the words of Jesus Christ and to make the offer to change their lives in his name. We'll talk about how to do that specific thing today, how to share the gospel with someone else. Let me start by disabusing you of the the, uh, uh, most frequently made excuse in uh, Christianity, at least as I have observed it. I have made it my own self internally and been called out for it by the Holy Spirit. You're not going to convert anybody by the way you live. No one looks at you when you do a kindness to them and gives praise and glory to Jesus. No one thinks when you're generous with your goods or when you show up to help them out in a time of trial or tribulation that Jesus is good. They think you're good and you can't save them. (laughs) We want to live like Jesus taught us to live. But when we then say, I'm living such a valiant life that people will be converted simply by looking at the sheer goodness that I'm laying upon the world, we are fooling ourselves and we're hiding our own cowardice. Because it is true, too, that the hardest thing in the world to do is to tell somebody, I really think you probably ought to give your life over to God because it's not going well with you in charge. And I don't want to lie to you. That is the message. However you find to put it that sits well with you, the message is always, look, examining the evidence, I'm telling you, you you better give your life over to somebody who knows what they're doing because it's obvious to me you do not. That's why we don't want to share the gospel because inherent in telling somebody they need Jesus is telling them (laughs) they have failed. They failed as a human being. They failed to accomplish whatever it was they were setting out to. And the things that are happening to them, well, that's the consequences of being the way they are. We are telling them that because it should be true of all Christians, too. If you've never had a moment in your life when, really, with abject disgust, you looked at yourself and thought, i got to stop, right? There's got to be something better than, than me being in charge. And then turn to Christ and ask him to take charge then the truth is you might be a churchgoer. But a Christian is somebody who's made the fundamental decision that they are not to be responsible for their own lives. They have to turn them over to God because they've wrecked their own existence. And at its heart, that's the message that we have for other people. You should stop now. You should quit being that way or following those things because you're messing it up really badly and and I know someone who can help you. 
That's the reason we don't want to tell other people about Christ, because it seems rude. We are at heart, as followers of Christ, nice people, polite to a, a fault. Right? I saw a show last week on Canadians and, and how Canadians fight, and they, they fight ever so politely, right? Lots of passive-aggressive stuff, <laughs> but the, no yelling, no, no, unless they're on a, an ice hockey rink, there, there's uh, no violence in Canada. They, they just out-nice each other. And, and I thought when I watched it, wow, that is the church, right? People c- can give us every opportunity for us to step in and say, look, brother, let me pray with you, right? Uh, have the humility to accept your need for God, and we won't do it because it reeks of judgment. Yeah, it does. It does reek of judgment. But if it's a judgment that we have ourselves already endured, then we're not telling from on high somebody else to do something that they need to do to be like us. We are identifying as brothers and sisters where it is that they can find solace and hope even in the worst time of their lives because we know what that is like. So when you've made friends and you've introduced your Christianity into the friendship and the ongoing conversation that is the friendship by telling them that you go to church and you love going to church and and you go to Bible study and you love going to Bible study and you pray because you love praying and all of those kinds of things because it is who you are. And and I sound like I'm teasing, but it's true. I love all of those things. Then they know that you're a Christian. They know uh, what direction your life is supposed to be headed. They know who you're supposed to be trying to serve. And when their time comes, when they are broken open, when they're sitting in the, in the filth and, and considering their options, you have already laid the groundwork to be able to say to them, let me tell you how this thing can go. Listen to Romans 10 as Paul addresses the same subject. He says, the word is near you, On your lips and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. Paul says clearly that to cement your own salvation... There is an aspect of your life of faith that requires that you share your faith with someone who does not know about it. That means we have to learn to give voice to it. Most of you, if I assigned you between now and next week to to write 10 things that Christians should not say when they're trying to witness, would easily be able to write a list of 10 things, right? Anything that reeks of arrogance, anything that is a put down, anything that seems like it's the stereotype of the modern Christian. Let's talk about how it actually should go. Number one. If you're in a friendship that you have developed in response to these teachings and the desire of our church to reach out to more people, and in that friendship you really have had the opportunity to naturally and normally talk about your life of faith, at least on the surface level, what will happen is in your friend's life a time will come that mimics something that you have experienced and you will feel, you will feel, in your heart that you should say something to them about their faith. You don't have to worry about judging when the time is exactly right. I promise you the Holy Spirit will nudge you or thump you depending on uh, how hard a case you are. But you will dream about it or you'll think about it or it will just rush to the front of your mind and you will find yourself thinking, I should tell them now. And you won't because you're nice and it's judgmental. When that happens, you should talk to your friends in the church, talk to your pastor and others, and ask them to pray for you. You pray for your friend in whatever dress they're in. Ask your friends and your pastor to pray for you so that you might find the courage to put on your big person pants and do what is asked of Christians, to go back to your friend and to witness to them and ask them the question. That's how the process actually works. Again, we're shying away from knocking on people's door and asking if they know they're going to hell. If what I'm laying out is too hard, you're welcome to try that, and and I'll give you time at the podium to come and tell us how how that goes for you. The Holy Spirit is a genuine, real being. 
It exists and it works. And it is not bound by our desires. It is not bound by our will. It does the will of God. And that means it will push you until these ideas form in your head. If you are intentional about serving God in this way, the Holy Spirit will alert you and and you will back off from it. That's why you need someone to be praying for you that as you go forward in the relationship, you can have the courage. The second thing, talk to your pastor, talk to your friend, talk to your Bible study group, whoever it is that you're sharing this with, and tell them, uh, I'm meeting my friend for whatever activity next Wednesday, and, and one way or the other before that night's over, I am going to witness to them. That's the date, and that's the time. Build in accountability because you're going to need that push. If left to your own devices, most people will say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and then they just can't do it again because it just doesn't seem right to judge somebody else. If you build in accountability and you say, pray for me because on Wednesday, I am going to stumble through this thing and do my best to give my witness to this person because I really believe that they need it and the Spirit is asking uh, them to do it. The, the idea of facing someone that you respect and having to say, I chickened out again, that helps you. It puts you in a place where you're more likely to actually give the witness, to find a way. Romans 10 states plainly that we must tell others about our faith, and we need to build an accountability in our lives to be able to do that. The conversation, I promise you, will be awkward, so do avoid sounding judgmental and arrogant that goes like this wow you're a mess i used to be a mess but i ain't no more because that person might hold the opinion thank god you're a christian because nobody else could love you but jesus so you don't need to compare and contrast how swell you are with how terrible they are just get that out of your mind it might have been done to you or you might have heard it but it It is what we're balking at. It's what makes us reticent to to share the gospel. The gospel is about Jesus and that person when you're sharing it. Really, that's uh, where it needs to stay. You need to recognize that you will be challenging what they already believe. Let me introduce you to the God that most people follow. You you might have heard of this uh, God. It is the God that says... If you put your mind to anything, you can do it. It is the God that says you're a champion even before you're a champion. It is a God that says that loneliness, that ache, that pain inside that suggests to you that something fundamental is missing in your life will be alleviated the minute you prove yourself to be better than anybody else around you. Champion of all you survey. Smartest one in the room, most industrious, the one with the most money, the one with the most toys, the one with the most power. That's the God of the modern world. The God of the modern world teaches that your happiness and your best and deepest fulfillment comes from the subjugation and humiliation of everyone around you until all proclaim you are the best there is. Most people who feel lousy about themselves and about their life and about the things that are going on feel lousy because they know they're never going to be able to attain sweet victory over every other human being, and it destroys them because they feel like failures. Am I talking in a, a, a way that you understand? That is the God that you are going to try to help them be released from. Recognize that. And know flat out that's what you're saying. The idea, and, and I won't, I'll try not to, to rant too much here, The idea that the whole point of Jesus is that he wants to make you a champion and wants to give you your heart's desires and and wants to make you better than everybody else in in the whole wide world is so sick. So sick. So arrogant. So twisted. So beyond the gospel that it makes me deeply, deeply sad that that's what much of Christianity is known for. Jesus does not want to help you pursue your dreams if your dreams are about being better than other people. Never is he going to do that. He wants to help you pursue your need to have import and meaning and relationship with all of those around you. We have to get that part straight. Okay, rant over. Finally, you're going to be worried, will I offend them? I hope so. I would be offended if you came in and said, hey, I, I think you're all wet and, and you need to go a whole new direction. Everything about your life's got to change, Steve. I've had that conversation with, I don't know, 200 or 300 church people over, over my life, and I can tell you it offends me. Eventually, 
in spite of all those objections. You simply have to suck it up and do what Christ has told you to do. When I learned to quit thinking about forgiveness and to practice it, it was horrible, horrible, one of the worst times of my life to hold up my enemies and people who had been cruel to me and, and, and to think that God was requiring of me that I just let them go, not even talk smack about them anymore, not even hate them secretly inside while I smiled on the outside. It was a detestable thing. But you can't be faithful unless you do what you're told to do. And God said, forgive them. Let them go. And in so much as I was able to do that, I found a freedom and a joy that has never been surpassed in my life. I promise you, if you find the courage to do what God has said and to witness to your faith, the exact same experience will happen to you, even if the person politely declines or angrily declines and says, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. You will find yourself closer to God because you have been more faithful to God. And when we're closer to God, the price is high to get there, but the reward is is immeasurable. Things uh, to keep in your mind. Remember that the way you proclaim the gospel has to do with your story. The story is kind of the same for everybody, and, and, and here it is in an alternate version from the wage of sin is death. Look, you were created by a power that's greater than you, and a power which rules everything uh, that we can see and can't see in the whole of reality. You are special in that reality because you were given free will. And with your free will, you can choose to be out of context or uh, out of rhythm with the great power. When you're out of rhythm, you get beat to death. When you're out of the will of God, living differently than God says to, Reality is constructed to pound you down and for there to be consequence. And you don't have the power to pull yourself back in to the right place. You have to have the power of the one who created, and that power is known through Jesus. Jesus can restore you to the place in creation that is meant for you, and when you are restored to that place, there is finally peace. That's my way of talking about it. My personal story goes like this. I observed very early in my life, my God, everybody around me that's an adult who I should be following or giving my heart to or trusting was either a drunk or a tyrant. And that's true. Everyone of import in my life that was an adult was out of their ever-loving minds. Alcoholism and, and cruelty abounded in my young life. And I knew by the time I was four or five years old, you can't trust any of these people. If they show up sober, they might be kind and they might help me with whatever. But if they're drunk, there ain't no telling what's going to happen. And mom, she didn't drink. She was just flat out mean. And the same thing. No way to discern what the adult that I had to go to with my problems was going to be like. That, friends, if you're a child, is hell. No one to trust or to follow. And my neighbors then took pity on me and started to take me to church. And in church they told me something I really had never heard before. This Jesus guy, you can trust him. That's what I heard. You can trust him. He'll take care of whatever your problems are, but you can trust him, and you can always trust him. And the guy that was saying that was older than I am now, Reverend Eustace. And the kids in the youth group and the uh, other kids in the church, they seemed to believe that you could trust Jesus too. My salvation came because I so desperately needed some adult somewhere that I could trust, and that adult was pointed out to me to be Jesus. So I made the decision to give my life to Jesus, and in my life what that meant was I'm going to do the stuff that Jesus says to do because Jesus is the same today, tomorrow, and forever, and there ain't nobody else in my life that is like that. That's how salvation looked to me. I do best when I talk to people whose main problem is that they're spinning out of control because they have also discovered you can't really trust anybody else. They can't trust their boss, they didn't trust their parents, they can't trust their spouse, and they're isolated and alone and afraid. You give me a conversation with somebody like that, and, and I can talk their language and explain Jesus in a way that's meaningful to them. That's how it works for me. I don't know how it works for you. It might work this way. You find somebody 
who's drunk all the time and just spiraling out of control and losing everything in their life, and you remember when you were that way too, and you remember what it was like when somebody explained to you that God would give you the power of sobriety, and you accepted that offer and gave your life to God, and your life has been changed since then. You should be talking to other people in that situation. The whole of evangelism takes place when we seek out other people who are lost in the way that we were lost. The prodigal son, for the rest of his life, if he was going to witness to the power and the authority of God in other people's lives, needed to look for spoiled young adults who took their inheritance and squandered it because he will flat out understand them and his judgment will be that they're no worse than he was. It eliminates the negative judgment and puts you in a place where you can say, I get it, me too. And that's a much more powerful way to offer Jesus Christ and salvation to someone than the more judgmental ways. You describe your life before I didn't trust anyone. I was lost and in trouble because of that. I didn't trust my own self. I'm not smart enough to be running my life. Describe what it's like to meet Jesus. Well, the church, the preacher, the Sunday school teacher, and my friends all told me the Same thing. Jesus had laid out how we should live. It was trustworthy and it led to good things. And that was the best offer on the table. Going away, the best offer on the table for me. And I had nothing to lose. Describe what it's like now. I have followed Jesus in my life when I was so arrogant and and stupid that even people who genuinely loved me could barely stand to be with me. And, And he stayed with me. I have followed Jesus when I've been beaten into humiliation and self-loathing and hatred and and even thought about ending my own life, and he stayed with me. I have followed Jesus when I lay in an ambulance dying of a heart attack and and was relieved and happy to be going into his eternal presence, And, and I have followed Jesus when I've been at the bedside of other people as they took their last breath, leaving their family and friends devastated, and Jesus has stayed with me every step of the journey. In the good days, in the bad days, in the days when I feel on top of it, in the days when I feel absolutely alone and lost, he's never, ever abandoned me. And I can't say that for anybody else. The people from my past who were good to me have frequently died on me. And the people in my future haven't been here for the rest of my life. Jesus is the glue that holds the whole story together. And he's the only good thing, truly wonderful, good, sacred, holy thing in my life. And I would not give, I would not give anything or receive anything to give up Jesus. I just wouldn't do it. Because whether I'm in the right or I'm in the wrong, he is with me. That's my story. I'm still following Jesus, just as excited about it as I was when I was a child, and he has proven himself to be worthy of all of my life and more. Have you ever experienced anything close to what I've been describing in your life? When the story of the prodigal son is told, can you look back and and think, yeah, that's right. My life did begin to change in profound ways when I made the decision to try to follow Jesus as best I could. Is that your story? I hope that it is. Really, I hope that all of this stuff uh, should be me just nudging you and and reminding you of of the path that you're on, uh, of the decision you've already made. But here's the truth. I I am aware that today as I preach this message that many people will have to say truthfully, I don't have that time in my life. I think church is a good idea, and and the idea of God is good for me, but I I don't really remember a time when I said, I'm going to give it all up and follow Jesus. That's not my story at all. And, And if the truth be told, the reason the modern church does not witness, does not share the faith, is because I I believe at least half of us, if not the majority of us, can't say the things that I'm saying this morning. You haven't been saved. You never really made a a free will decision to give your life to Jesus Christ, to consider the alternatives and and to throw in with him and and to promise and do everything I can to live the way you want me to live. You've gone to church, you've been confirmed, you've sung the hymns, you've done all the stuff that that, uh, people of Christ do without ever making the internal decision. If that's true of you, there's no finer time than today in this mess that we call COVID with everybody's future completely uncertain. Really, there's not. 
if as I talk about witnessing, you're thinking, that ain't going to happen, brother, because I don't know what you're talking about. You should know what I'm talking about. And, and not only you should know what I'm talking about, my goodness, it's probably time for you to feel what I'm talking about. Because if you don't have Christ, I promise, you're alone and afraid. I promise. Even if you're chock full of confidence that you'll figure this one out too, there's going to come a time when that isn't true and you'll know it. You, you'll really know it in a savage, horrible way. You should give your life to Jesus because he's worthy of it. You should throw in with him, really, fully, and just dedicate yourself to trying to be as Christ-like as you possibly can and to open yourself up to be forgiven by him and restarted by, by him because there isn't anything that's being offered to you that could possibly match what he actually gives to you. It, it's true. It's not a head thing. It, it's a heart thing. He'll transform not only the rest of your life in the flesh, he'll transform your eternal life. So just in case you're not ready really to, to go out and, and to witness, I, I, I want to offer Jesus Christ to you today. If you're looking the part, if you're doing all the things you're supposed to do as a Christian, but the, the idea that Christ is your personal Lord and Savior and, and that you've been honest and earnest enough with him to tell him the stuff that's in your life that shouldn't be, Today is your opportunity. Really, that's how it works. You might be feeling the Holy Spirit work in your heart now. I'm going to lead us in, in a prayer, and, and as I lead us in that prayer, I invite you to open your heart and to tell Christ that you accept his offer and, and that you dedicate your life to him, and you're going to start that today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we recognize that we have to have the gift of your Son to remove our sins, and we accept that gift. We are sorry for the things that we've done and the things that we should have done that we've left on the side. We're sorry for being selfish. We're sorry for being lost and angry. We're sorry for blaming others for our troubles. We recognize, Father, that our life is in the state that we put it in. And we ask for forgiveness for that. And we ask also that you would bless us, that you would cleanse us, that you would give us a profound hope that today our life starts again. And we promise, as fully as we can, to begin today to dedicate ourselves to the teachings of your Son, to coming to know the Holy Spirit, and to living in this life for the salvation of others. Bless us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Scrub deep. Make us clean. And guide us for the rest of our lives. In Christ's name, amen.
bless you. I hope to see you next week in worship.